Let's, uh, let's bow our heads together and ask the Lord to be with us as we, as we look at his word. Father God, we, uh, we do bless your name. You are worthy uh, of that, You're worthy of our hearts, our lives. You are good, Lord, in all the ways that you have been uh, faithful to us. We thank you for the salvation that is ours, for the redemption purchased by the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that that redemption has brought us into relationship with you, Lord, where you are now at work forming and molding a people to be yours and to be yours in this world. Uh, Lord, that means that how we live and how we think matters to you and it should matter to us. It means that our, our character and its formation and, and likeness to Christ, that matters to you and it should matter to us. And, and for us to see these things happen in our lives, Lord, for us to see the kind of, of transformation you would want for your people in this world even. We need you. We need your word. Uh, we need to know your mind and your will. We need to know what is important to you. We need to know who you are and what you are like. And, and we need to know the God that we believe in, the God that we can put our confidence and trust in so that we can live faithfully in a world that is is bent away from you and is leading us, Lord, in directions that would dishonor you. And I pray that you would forgive us for allowing the world to shape our character, that you would forgive us for allowing the world to shape the way we think and live, and that you would bring us back, Lord, to your truth and to your word, and by the power of your spirit, you would grab a hold of us again, and that you would, Lord, change us and, and mold us and shape us into the image of your son, which is what we have been redeemed to be like. And so, Lord, today, even as we turn to this passage of scripture that is before us and, 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 and as we think about some of the things that I'll be talking about in this sermon, things that are incredibly difficult and hard for us to, to embrace, to, to at times believe and, and, and certainly to do. Uh, we pray, Lord, that the word would, would break into us and, and would challenge us to a new way of living and uh, a new way of responding and, and, and a greater trust in you. And so open our ears, our hearts, Lord, today. By the power of your spirit, make your word real and living to us. Uh, I pray that you would bless me as I stand before your people to preach your word, Lord, in my frailty and weakness. I need you to be strong today to bring back those things that I have studied and thought about, but, but more than that, Lord, to say those things that you would have me say to your people for building us up and for blessing us, Lord, for the life of the kingdom of God. And so go before us now, we, we pray in Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them with me to Genesis chapter four. Genesis four, we are coming back to this study in Genesis. If, if you are regular here at Redeemer, you'll know that beginning last fall at some point, I started a sermon series on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Took a break from that in, in order to uh, preach this short Christmas series that I did, Christmas with the Apostle Paul. But today we're going to pick back up in, in uh, Genesis. And what we'll do is we'll pick back up where we, we left off. Uh, last time we were together, we started the, the, the story of Cain and Abel. And, and, and you know that, that story, what happened there. Um, and we saw Cain slaying his brother Abel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we move into the sermon. But today we're going to pick up our reading at verse 10. And I'm going to read down through verse 15. So, so Genesis chapter 4, verse 10 through verse 15. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain lest any who found him should attack him. And this is God's word. You know, I, I can imagine that, that almost all of us who are here today have had experiences in our lives where people have, have done wrong to us, uh, totally undeserved, um, and, and they've, they've, if they've done evil towards us. They've, they've hurt us. Uh, they've done an injustice to us. 
Um, they have, have responded in ways to us that they should not have responded. All of us who are here have had those kind of experiences in our lives. It's, it's, it's life lived in, in the world that we live in, that we experience injustices in, in this world. We experience harm in this world. I can also imagine, though, because I know my own heart and I know what we are like, that in those times when, when people have done us wrong and there was no, no reason for the wrong that they've done to us, that we wanted to, to strike back at them in the, in the way that they've hurt us. And so if a person hurts me in a particular way, I want to I hurt them back in, in that kind of way as, as well. Now, in, in the midst of those times when people harm us and, and we, we want to react back to them, I know, I know at least for me, I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a verse of scripture that, that always challenges me, but, but also I find it's, it's a helpful verse to me in terms of how to respond and deal with these times when people are doing, doing evil towards me. And it comes from, from Paul. It comes from Romans 12, verse 19. There, the apostle Paul says this, beloved, never avenge yourselves. And notice that. And he doesn't say, all right, here's certain times when you can avenge yourselves. Here's certain times when you can strike back. I mean, Paul doesn't equivocate at all here. I mean, he just lays it out. It's crystal clear. Never, Christian, this is it. Never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I mean, that's an amazing thing to, to hear that is, is to form the, the Christian character. That's what we are to be like. In fact, Paul says that right after saying a couple of other things that are pretty amazing as well. And these are things that Jesus would say also. If you've been here for Ryan's um, Beatitude sermon, you've heard some of this. But, but right earlier than that, in, in that Romans 12 chapter, in verse 14, Paul says this. And I think he's pretty much quoting from, from Jesus. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That's what we're called to do as Christians. He also says this in verse 17 of that same Romans 12 passage. Repay no one evil for evil. And I, I just, I began the sermon by talking about how, how easy it is for us to, to, to do that and, and actually want to do that. When somebody's done evil, I want to do evil back. Now, when you hear these verses, I know part of it is that we listen to them and we think about our own experience and we go, man, that, that sounds, it sounds impossible to, to live that way. Is Paul, Paul calling us to the impossible? What do, you, what do you think? Is that the Bible? Is the Bible calling us to the impossible? Huh? I, th I think when you really do get at what Paul is doing there in that Romans 12 chapter, it's, it's he's, he's doing this. He's not calling us to impossible human behavior. What he's calling us to do is to trust God. That's what he's calling us to. It's to trust that God has this. To trust that God is, is in control of this. And ultimately to trust that our God is a God of, of ultimate justice and that we will find that justice in, in ultimately in, in our own lives. It's some, we're going to find that. Now, as we, we look at the passage today from Genesis chapter 4, and there's a reason I wanted to begin that way. It's because of how I want you to think about this passage and apply it to your life. But in this passage, what we see here is we see a God of justice. And we see this God of justice both in, in the way that he, he vindicates Abel, but also in the way that he punishes Cain. And I want us to, to talk through those things and to think about God and as, a, as the God that he is. Because when it all does come down to it, I, I think what, in order to live the lives that we are called to live and for our character to be formed in the ways that it is to be formed, that's counter to the ways of this world and the ways that we are so often taught in this world, then what we have to do is believe something about God. We have to trust in God. And that's what we see in this passage, that God is a God that we can trust and we can trust him being a God of ultimate justice. Now, when we talk about then the, the vindication of Abel, this is, this is, and you remember the story. I mean, Abel was killed by his brother. And, and you remember what, what caused all of that. Abel brought an offering to the Lord and it was pleasing to the Lord. In my opinion is that he, that offering was pleasing to the Lord because he brought it in faith. It was the first fruits of his, of, of, of his flock. And, and, and compare that to Cain, who basically just brought some of the, the fruit of the ground. And, and as a result of it, God 
God received Abel's offering, but he did not receive Cain's. Now, you remember what happened then. Cain was, was furious. He was, he was so angry because God had received his brother's offering, but not his. And so he took that out on his brother. He probably lured him out into this field. And, and then he took his life. He, he killed him. Now, we begin to see God's response to all of that. If you, if you look at verse 9. In verse 9, we talked about the last time we were in Genesis, but just as a, as a reminder to you. And, and I want you to, to, to think about these, these things in terms of, of what, the way God works with us and, and what he does. So he begins verse 9. And the Lord said to Cain, so he's now responding, where is Abel your brother? Now, something that's important to realize there is when, when God is asking Cain this question, he, he's not asking the question as if he doesn't know what has happened or know what's transpired. And that's important for us to realize because when, when, when we deal with I guess you could describe it as the mysteries of God's providence and the ways that, that God does allow this, all kinds of things to come our way that, are, that at times are awful and, and the harm to come our way and injustices to come our way. That's not happening because God doesn't know what's going on in, in his world. It doesn't happen because God doesn't know what's going on in your life. That's not the reason for all of that. I don't quite understand the mystery of God's providence. I, don't, I couldn't answer to you why God allows certain things to happen to his people. But, but God does promise to work in the midst of all this. So when he comes to Cain and he asks the question, where is Abel your brother? He knows exactly where Abel is. But he's asking that question in the same way that he asked Adam and Eve the question when they had committed sin. And he goes into the garden, remember, and he asked, where are you? He knew where Adam and Eve were. They weren't hiding behind a tree. It's like God can't see through this tree because it's like lead and he has like Superman eyes and can't see through lead. He knew exactly where they were, right? He knew exactly where they were. The question is to bring out what they've done, to, to help them to begin to face up to what they have done. And ultimately, and I think this is one of the great things about what you see in these early chapters of the Bible, to, to offer this, this hand of grace for repentance. Now, Adam and Eve, they, they, they begin to come around. Cain doesn't. Here's the question, I mean, to Cain, you know, where's, where's Abel, your brother? And he responds, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, if you were here the last time we were in this, I would say, yes, we are. We are our brother's keepers. And I, I want to make sure that's clear to us. We are our brother's keepers. Cain got it wrong. He should have been the keeper of his brother, but he destroyed his brother. He murdered his brother. And so in verse 10, it goes on to say this. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Okay. All right. The Bible, this is something that's really important for us to understand. And people who will tell you differently than this are lying to you. Okay. The Bible never ever offers us promises as believers in Christ that harm will not come to us. The Bible never promises to us as believers in Christ that we won't face injustices. The Bible never promises to us that if we just trust in Jesus enough, we may not ever be killed by somebody. It does, it, in fact, I, I think if you, if you look at the tenor of Scripture, it's just the opposite of that. Now, there are times in the Bible, of course, where people have cried out to God and, and, and they've been rescued. There are times in our lives where we cry out to God and he rescues. I'm not saying that that can't happen and God doesn't do that. But what I am saying to you that's incredibly important for us to hear is that the Bible does not promise us that we may not be harmed and may not lose our lives. We very well may lose our lives for standing in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However... Here's what's so amazing about verse 10 is that even God's man, Abel, who had lost his life at the hands of his own brother. Notice what's being said here. His blood is crying out. This thing isn't done. It's the point. It's not over yet. In other words, when we, we think about the, 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 the reality of justice and of God's providence and the ways that he works. Please, my fellow Christians, do not limit this to the time that you have your first breath and your last breath. That's not the end of this. It is not when you go to the grave. 
in, in fact, the, the justice that you are seeking and that you want, you may not ultimately get that until eternity. But here's the promise. You will get it. Abel's blood cried out. And you know, in the Bible, it's, it's really interesting because you see these cries out to God about the injustices of the world. And God hears them. He hears them. He will not fail us. He will never fail us. We can trust him. And this is what you're, you're seeing here. I mean, you, you think about this, this. Let's just kind of walk through some of the stories a little bit. You think about Jesus. And then this man of, of just perfect obedience to the Father. And he suffered and he died. And if you think about Stephen, let me give you Stephen from, from Acts chapter 7. This, this man is just f- was faithfully proclaiming the word of God. And, and you, do you remember that story? His own people, they, 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 they started to stone him. But here's something that happened. It just kind of gives you a sense that, that God is, is he's on the side of us. And he's on the side of us no matter how much you may experience pain and suffering and even loss in this life to, to allow your faith to look past that, to trust in God. And, and, and here's Stephen, and he did. And this is glorious picture in Acts 7 where it's like the, the sky parts. Remember that? And Stephen sees someone. You remember who it is? <laughs> it's Jesus, not just seated at the right hand of God, which is the way he's always described as standing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Standing for his servant. Right? And, and as a result of that, I, I think it has everything to do with, with what Stephen is then able to do because, because what you're seeing is his heart is, is being molded and, and conformed to, to his Savior, Jesus. And Jesus did the same thing. And what did, what did Stephen do? He, went, he did what Jesus did. He cried out before his death, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You remember there were some other apostles who, who didn't get this right away. Remember the Sons of Thunder? I mean, you do, you do wrong. That's, that's, that's kind of like us a lot, right? Yeah, I, I, I want to be the son of thunder and lightning and hellstone and brimstone and all kind of stuff, you know? It's not getting Jesus. It's not getting God. And it's not getting his justice. And it's not getting that he has you. And it's not getting that he loves you. And he will be faithful to you. But it is so easy for us to want vengeance instead. Now, let me, let me just quickly say something. Obviously, there are, and the Bible makes this clear, there are, there are God-ordained and God-honoring ways for us to seek remedy to wrongs in our lives. The Bible talks about that. In fact, I think the establishment of authority in the Bible is to that end. I mean, when you think about, now governments aren't always this, but when you think about what governments are, are for, they, they are, in, in the Bible, directly describes them this way. It's instruments of, of God's vengeance and for our good. There's authorities of the church and home and all these different kinds. I think the Bible actually allows us to think about appropriate ways of, of God, as Christians, of God honoring civil disobedience against injustices and wrongs. I think the Bible allows us to go there as well. But I tell you what the Bible does not allow us to do, Christians, and that is to seek personal vengeance. There's no ifs, ands, or buts around this. The Bible does not allow that. Paul says it clearly. It is a lack of trust in God. Now, I doubt anyone who is here today, you're out you know, looking to do somebody some kind of serious bodily harm. I mean, maybe you are. Let me call you back if you are. But I tell you what we do. We exact vengeance on people all the time with our attitudes, don't we? We exact vengeance all the time with, with our words, either using them or not using them. You know, I, you know I, and the, and the, I, 
you know, I, I, I'm, I like to be honest with you guys because I want you to be honest with yourself, but I'm telling you, I, I can't tell you how many times in my marriage I've exacted some serious vengeance on my wife. I never hit her ever. Never did anything physical to her. It was with my mouth, either opening or not opening. It was with my disposition, either in giving affection or withholding affection. And in all these ways, I, it, 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 what's happening is I'm saying this in my mind. I'm going to show her. I'm going to get her back. I'm, I'm going to prove to her how much she's wronged me. And, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to resolve the matter myself. And see, that's the lack of faith. It, it's, it's trying to take it in our hands and go, there's, there's, it, because this is what we're thinking. There's no one who's going to bring justice to this matter. There's no one who's going to resolve this thing. There's no one who's going to ultimately work this out. And I'm not believing that God is the one who will take care of all this. Now, what do I do? I trust him. And I seek to honor him. And I live for him. And the moment that I'm in, whatever that may be, because I'm believing God. Now, when you look at the passage, you do see God not only hearing the blood of Abel crying out, but you see, you see a just punishment, don't you, on Cain. You see that here. Right? You look at 11 and 12. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth. Now, the first thing I want you to, to notice here, and it's, it's striking, and I'll show you how in just a second. It's when God says to Cain, you are cursed from the ground. And that's, that stands out. And the reason it stands out is because up to this point, God is, is not, he's not cursed a, a person before. In fact, if you go back with me in your thinking, you'll remember that when Adam and Eve fell into sin... God, and remember, the serpent was involved in that under the, the guise and influence of, of Satan. So God pronounces a curse upon the serpent in Genesis 3.14. He pronounces a curse upon the ground in Genesis 3.17 as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. But he, he doesn't place a curse on, on Adam and Eve. He doesn't do that. Now here, Cain slays his brother, Abel. And God says, in the midst of that, you, you are cursed from the ground. That curse is on him. Cain, you are cursed from, from the ground. And this is important because what it, what it does is it helps us to identify, I think, a, a little bit of a larger perspective on this story. You know, it's easy for us to look at the story of Cain and Abel and, and just simply say, all right, this is the first instance in the Bible of fratricide or a brother killing a brother. Okay. And that would be true. But, but it's, it's also, it's more than that. Because when, when God pronounces this curse upon Cain, what I think that's, that's a hint at for us is that, that Cain is actually in line with whom? Who was cursed before? The serpent. That he's in line with the serpent. Now, why does that matter? Because when you look at this story, what I, I think you're actually seeing, it's not just a brother killing a brother, but you've seen that the, the seed of the serpent, you remember this back from Genesis 3.15, and the seed of the woman, right? And so the seed of the serpent is, it ends up being Cain, right? And Cain's, Cain's response to the seed of the woman, and that seed of the woman is Abel, and it's a, it's a beginning of a fulfillment of something that we will see throughout, have seen throughout the Bible and will see throughout church history, where the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, right? Now, I, I could tell you where you, you could see that talked about in the New Testament. In, in 1, 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, listen to what John says. He says to us, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. See, he, he, Cain isn't just viewed in the Bible as someone who lost his temper, right? He's described in the Bible as, as of, the, of, the, the, of the seed of the evil one. He is of the evil one. And that's why, why did he murder him? John goes on to say, because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, what am I getting at here? 
that from, from the very children of Adam and Eve and on through the Bible and on through the history of the church, what we have seen is this, this great sort of spiritual battle of these, these seeds, the seed of the evil one and the seed of the woman, the redemptive line and not. And what you see over and over in the Bible, when you see it in, to this day in the world, and you and I should not be surprised if this doesn't start happening to us as we stand for the truth of the gospel and continue to stand for the truth of the gospel, that there won't be times in which we are attacked and there won't be times in which we are harmed and there won't be times in which people will reject us. Why? Because we are a part of the line of right. And we don't come at this in any kind of sort of self-righteous posture or anything. I'm just simply talking to you about what does it mean to live for Jesus in a fallen and broken world? What does it mean to honor Jesus in the world that we live in? What does it mean to stand up for what is true and right and, and honor him in the gospel? And living that out regardless and then recognizing that in the midst of doing that, there will be attacks upon us. And, uh, and here's what happens way too much. We, we as, as, as American Christians who've been blessed with so much, we seem to think when, when these things happen that they should never happen to us, which is not the Bible, or we turn around and think that the way that I'm going to respond to this happening to me is the way the world responds to this happening to me. When in fact... What we know and must trust in and rest ourselves in is what you see in this passage. And what that is, is this. Yes, Abel lost his life. But eternally, that was a bruise. It was a bruise. Satan will not win. The seed of the serpent will not win. God will not allow it to happen. See, this is the point. Cain doesn't get off. It's kind of like, let me sneak him out into the field. Let me kill him, hide him in a bunch of dirt under some rocks and run away. And I'm okay because I looked all around. And nobody was there to see me. And all those little places where you, it's coming at you and you're getting hurt and you're feeling it. God, he's right there. You know that. He's right there. He sees right there. He's with you right there. You know, if you look, notice the punishment of Cain in this passage, it's, it, is, it is just... It's just consequences. It's, it's, you know, it's amazing how when you, when you look at all of this, how God just sort of reminds us that he is a God of, of great justice. His judgments are always right. You know, Cain, back in verse 2 of chapter 4, is indicated he was a worker of the ground. That's why he brought the fruit, because that's what he did. But he kills his brother, and notice what he loses. He loses the ground, and... In verses 11 and 12, it says, The ground which opened its mouth to receive his brother's, your brother's blood will no longer yield to you its strength. Justice. There were social consequences for what he did. This is justice. He would become a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. God is just. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. He's just for you. Don't doubt it. Psalmist David would say, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. But you know what else he feels? And it's, you see this here with Cain, too. And it's this, this other part of the story, this, this sort of turn that's this, as beautiful and helpful to us as knowing there will be justice. And that is 
you see within that justice just this reality of grace and mercy too. You know, in, in so many ways, you know, I, I, as I've thought about Cain and Abel, I, I, think, I think because we are the, uh, in Christ or are the seed of the woman, you, you should see yourself in Abel. But there's some things that you should see of yourself in Cain, too. You're not of the seed of, of the woman because you, you don't have that murderous instinct in your heart. You do. And it's expressed itself there to you. It's there. And if the only thing that God ever gave to us was just justice, not one of us here would be here. Right? And so even as you see the justice of God towards Cain in response to what he's done and in, in, in protection of Abel, all of those things are true. You also see something else. You see a, a, a kindness and an extension of, of mercy to him. I mean, if you notice verse 13 again, it says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now this isn't, this isn't, Cain becoming guilty. It isn't Cain showing remorse. It isn't Cain repenting. It isn't any of those, those kinds of things. In fact, it's all self-serving. It's all a sense of him, him being concerned about his own well-being. And that comes out in verse 14 where it says, Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. In other words, the one who killed his own brother is now concerned about what? That someone's going to take vengeance out on him. That's what his concern is. So why didn't God just let that happen? Notice what he does in verse 15. The Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord put a mark on Cain as any who found him should attack him. All right, there has been endless speculation as to what this mark of Cain was. Some of it utterly, absolutely horrific. Okay. Since everybody else has given their two cents, I'll give you mine. The mark on Cain is, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't have a clue what that thing was. <laughs> I don't know. It was something. I don't know what it was. People have done ridiculous things with that. I mean, goodness gracious, some of this stuff. You know, it, you know, some thought it was a tattoo, some kind of, you know, probably cool tattoo. I don't know. Like, leave me alone. I don't know. <laughs> Mayor Klein, one of my Old Testament professors, actually thought it was, and this, this is kind of weighty a little bit. He didn't know either. He's one of the smartest guys I know. He didn't know. Um, but isn't the, you know, as you keep moving on, he thought that the mark was probably the mark of the establishment of justice, the city. I read, I wish I knew, remember who this was, but it was a couple of weeks ago when I prepared this sermon because I took a Christmas break. So. But anyway, somebody actually, read, actually said that the mark was a, a bad dog. Can you believe that? So Kay was walking around with it. So this was like an ancient church theologian said it was a big old dog. That would probably work. We don't know what the mark was. That's not the point. The point is its purpose. And what was its purpose? It was, it was to warn and it was to protect. You cannot take vengeance out on this man. See, see God isn't just concerned about, about us and our receiving of justice. He's concerned about justice in this world. You know that, right? He's concerned that we don't live in a world of anarchy. He's concerned that we don't live in a world where people just take personal vengeance against each other. That those, those are not to be the ways that we live in this world. Right? So that common, it's, it's grace in a common sense and that it's a common grace and a common good so that, that God would want there to be justice for the, for, for the just and the unjust and justice for the righteous and the unrighteous. That that's what our God is like. But there's something else here as well. And this is what I want you to sense and feel. That in so many ways, Cain, Cain still belonged to God. And here is, here is this extension of, 
of grace and mercy and patience. You know that? You remember over in 2 Peter and, and, and where folks are just sort of wrestling through, why does the end come? Why isn't all this resolved immediately? And why is God so slow to, to answer all of this? And you remember how, how it's answered? It's, it may seem slow to you, but here's our God who is patient with us. To what end? So that we would repent and come to know him and be saved. See, the end of that Romans 12 passage the way that ends, where it tells us don't seek vengeance, don't do all that, it tells us this. Don't respond to evil with evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. With good. Why? Because what should be our desires? As we are being molded and shaped by a God of ultimate justice, a God of present grace towards us and towards the world, what should it be? I'm going to pour myself out in good towards others. Why? Because I want People to be saved. I was an enemy of God. And now I'm a friend. Not because I got God right, but because God came after me in grace. That's how we respond to others. And I would pray for us that as we learn more about what it means to trust the God of grace and justice, that that would shape character. That would shape our hearts. That would shape how we think. I do believe so often Christians go around and they have an enemy list in this world. And I can imagine some of you here today, you have it. It's your enemy list. How does an enemy come to know Jesus? By you and I doing what Jesus calls us to do towards our enemies. And that's by the power of the Spirit of God. Love them. Even as God has loved an enemy like me and you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for this reminder of who you are, of your wondrous character and grace and love towards us. Lord, it, so often for, for us and for, I know for me, my life just becomes formed by what is happening around me, what I see going on. And, and because of that, Lord, it's, it's hard for me to trust and believe that you are these things in the midst of what is going on. I pray that you would help all of us to grow in faith. To trust you in spite of. To believe that you are just and righteous and good and gracious in spite of. And to live for you. Whatever may come our way. That was Jesus. And he didn't die for us. So we wouldn't have to do that. He died for us. So we can. Help us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.